welcome everyone to Grand Rounds and thank you so much for joining us again on this beautiful late winter day. I am going to invite Dr. Erna Kojic, Milu Kojic, who's our Division Chief for Infectious Diseases to invite, uh, to introduce today's speaker. And thank you, Dr. Kojic. So good morning, everyone, and welcome Dr. Kramer to our virtual Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We're very happy to have you here. As an introduction, Dr. Kramer's virology work and training started at the University of Natural Resources and, Nat and Life Sciences in Vienna, working on the expression and purification of proteins and different viral particles. He then pursued his PhD work at the esteemed Vienna Institute of Biotechnology before assuming a position as a postdoc here at the Department of Microbiology at the Mount Sinai, uh, at Mount, I, I can School of Medicine at Mount Sinai under the mentorship of Dr. Polisi. Postdoc work as a virologist focused on the design of a universal flu vaccine utilizing his expertise in recombinant protein expression. Um, obviously his work has resulted in an impressive list of publications. We're talking in the hundreds, as well as becoming a full tenured professor within the Department of Microbiology in 2018. Um, his own lab work uh, focusing on the immune responses um, to different RNA viruses including illuminating the differences in antibody responses from a natural viral infection, as opposed to those induced by vaccines. So this expertise, this particular expertise and work on RNA viruses was ideal uh, to respond to a, uh, and work on this novel RNA virus that shaked the world literally uh, or uh, a year ago, or SARS-CoV-2. And sure enough, within weeks of the recognition of an emerging RNA virus spreading, even before it was, it was established as a pandemic, Dr. Kramer's lab in January 2020 um, developed reagents and assays for serological testing and characterization of the virus responses. So obviously, um, Dr. Kramer's work subsequently established the Mount Sinai Virology Lab uh, as a leading force in the COVID response, not just within our Sinai family, but also um, in the national and international community. So, Thank you, Dr. Kramer, for all of your work. And we are looking forward to, to your talk. While I know that some of this may be all Chinese to us, I also learned from a little bird that you actually speak Chinese. So thank you <laughs> and over to you. Thanks for this very nice introduction. So uh, I, I, I started to learn Chinese. I don't speak it, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> at least. Uh, I heard different. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm um, going to share my slides here. Um, I hope you can all see them. Yep, we and can. I wanted to, to start out with focusing a little bit uh, on immune responses that we get against uh, when we get infected with SARS coronavirus 2. And then, of course, I wanted to talk about COVID 19 vaccines and all the news that we have right now with the new vaccine and also with, uh, with the variants. Uh, just uh, my disclosures uh, we are working here on vaccines too, and of course, on, on assays, and uh, Mount Sinai has filed IP on this, um, but I'm not going to talk about our vaccines today. Uh, because they are too, a little bit too early uh, at the preclinical stage right now. Um, but let's talk about immunity to SARS coronavirus 2. Um, so by now you're all familiar with the virus. Here's a schematic of, of the virion. Uh, you have an RNA genome on the inside that's covered by a nuclear protein. Uh, then you have a, an envelope, a lipid envelope that's host cell derived with two proteins in there, the envelope protein and the matrix protein. And then we have this huge spike protein on the surface. And that spike protein is very important because that's the 
part of the virus that binds to our cells. And here on the right side, I'm showing a crystal structure of the spike protein. Uh, this is a homotrimer. I've uh, colored one monomer in dark blue, and then the receptor binding domain of that monomer in red. So the receptor binding domain is really what binds to our cells. And so you can imagine that uh, our body makes, when we get infected, makes antibodies against many of these viral components. And we know by now that um, antibodies that are made against the spike, and specifically the receptor binding domain, can neutralize the virus because they bind to the spike and then the virus just can't bind to our cells anymore. Um, we also know that we get antibodies against the nuclear protein. They can be measured, and a lot of serological assays actually measure those antibodies. But we don't know if these antibodies are actually helpful, they, but they can help to figure out if somebody was infected. In addition to that, we get uh, T cell responses, both to um, infection and, and uh, vaccination. And what has been seen is that uh, there is a relatively strong CD4 T cell response and a relatively weak CD8 T cell response. So CD4 T cells are basically uh, the helper cells that uh, uh, increase the, the uh, response of, of uh, T cells uh, and uh, cytotoxic T cells, CD8, uh, uh, T cells are, are mostly cytotoxic T cells. So very early last year, um, we started to, to look into antibody responses of people who had been infected. And as you all know, Mount Sinai started a relatively large um, plasma donor program. And after we had the first about 1,300 individuals in for the plasma donor program, we did an analysis. And we had two types of donors. We had PCR-confirmed donors, um, where we knew they were infected. And it turned out that the vast majority of them actually had antibodies. And then we had COVID-19 suspected donors. You know, in, in the beginning, it was not so easy to get tested. Uh, flu was still around. A lot of people who had symptoms suspected that they had COVID. And so they, they became part of the donor program and we tested them. And it turns out that only 40% of them had antibodies. Probably the other 60% uh, never had a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And uh, this work continued and it's still continuing uh, in collaboration with the clinical laboratory. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, this is a, uh, from a paper that was published in, in fall in Science, where we looked at the antibody responses in the first 30,000 people that we found to be positive. And uh, when you, now this changed, but when you sent uh, a sample to, to the clinical laboratory, you got these titers back, 1 to 80 to 1 to 160, uh, were counted as low titers, and about 7% of positive individuals had low titers. 1 to 320 was counted as an int intermediate titer, and uh, about 20% of individuals had these intermediate titers, and 1 to 960 and 1 to 2880 uh, were uh, basically classified as high titers, and the vast majority of people actually had these high titers, about 70%. And here on the right side, I'm just showing you positives over time, uh, from basically April till October. Uh, this fluctuates, fluctuates a little bit because uh, there was not always uh, the many samples that were run, uh, but basically uh, the blue line here indicates um, samples, the proportion of samples per day that had a data of 1 to 320 or higher. And that's oscillating around 90%. Basically meaning that um, the antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 infection is relatively robust and, and seems to be fairly normal. Um, we also wanted to know what function these antibodies have. We measure them against the spike protein, but an ELISA is just a binding assay, so you don't learn about functionality. So we also did uh, neutralization assays with authentic SARS coronavirus 2, which we isolate from patients and we grow it here in our biosafety level 3 lab. And so we did a correlation analysis here on the y axis. Uh, you see the neutralizing activity on the x axis. Uh, you see the, the binding titers, and we see a very nice correlation between uh, binding and neutralization, meaning the more uh, binding, uh, the higher your value in an ELISA is, the more neutralizing activity you have. Um, and you might remember in the, in the beginning of, or in, the, in spring last year, there were a lot of reports about, you know, people uh, losing their antibodies within a few weeks. And uh, while this did not make any sense from a, from a B cell point of view, uh, we wanted to look into that. And so uh, of our, our donors, the positive donors, we recruited uh, about 120 and we followed them over time. 
Um, and so they were bled around day 30, around day 82, and around day 148, so five months out. Um, and what, hap what we see here is that initially the data are pretty stable and then they start to decline a little bit. We actually have a seven month time point and it's kind of a flat line, so nothing's happening anymore. Um, but we also looked, we stratified by initial data and we see that if you have initially a higher data, uh, there is a steeper decline, about threefold over five months. While if you have initially a lower data, there might even be an increase um, and then there is a, a very slow decline. Uh, so the message here is uh, if you have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, they're not just, they're not disappearing, they're not going away within a few months. Um, we also looked at neutralizing activity over time and also that is maintained. There's some drop over five months, but it's not drastic. And uh, there's still at five months out a good correlation between binding antibody and neutralizing antibody. Uh, so this looks all fairly no normal, uh, like an immune response to any, almost any uh, viral uh, respiratory virus. Uh, but what, what does it all mean? Um, so, uh, last year, uh, there were some uh, very nice animal studies that were conducted. Uh, the first one um, was in, in rhesus macaques, where uh, these animals were infected with SARS-CoV-2. They're a pretty nice model for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and what you can see here on the left side are uh, basically uh, copy numbers of the virus in, in bowel fluid uh, of these animals. Um, so the virus does replicate and at some point it's cleared. It's not severe disease that these animals get, but it's comparable to mild disease in humans. And then they were challenged again uh, at the later time point. And what uh, was observed here was that these animals were protected. Uh, there is some uh, blip here, but that's probably input virus from, from the challenge virus that was given to these animals. Uh, so the conclusion here was um, uh, infection protects from reinfection. Uh, at the same time, actually the same group, the same investigators tested a, a experimental vaccine, also in non-human primates, that gave a variety of neutralizing antibody titers. And so they could do a correlation analysis and found that having neutralizing antibodies really nicely correlates with protection. And this uh, is a log scale here, so this is a 1 to 100 titer. That's not even that much. Uh, so this was good, and that was the first evidence that neutralizing antibodies could uh, provide protection. And um, why is this important? Uh, for many infectious diseases, for many vaccines, um, we have correlates of protection. So you measure usually an antibody diet and serum, and you can tell if this person is at risk for infection or if that person will be protected. And that's very important for public health in, uh, decisions, but it's also important for the patient because if, you know, uh, the level is below what you would assume is protective, uh, you can uh, ask the patient to get uh, vaccinated again. And so we have these correlates of protection for Hep A, B, uh, for influenza, we have the famous 1 to 40 HI titer. For measles, we have a neutralization assay and so on and so forth. And so, um, the first, uh, the first evidence that neutralizing antibodies could be a correlate of protection in, in humans uh, came from a very interesting study that was done uh, in Seattle by the uh, Granning and Bloom Labs. Uh, they recruited the, the crew of a, a commercial fishing vessel, 122 people. They tested uh, their uh, serum for neutralizing activity and found out that three had neutralizing antibodies. Then the, the uh, ship left uh, for their fishing trip and uh, they had an outbreak on board. And as it is the case, usually in the, on these ships, uh, we've seen that with the cruise ships, the deck rates are very high because there's a lot of interaction between people. There's nowhere to go. And so they had an 82.5% deck rate. And the three people with neutralizing antibodies did not get infected. Uh, that's a small number, but it's statistically significant. And there's now more and more data coming out. Uh, there's actually two studies from the US showing that, uh, two from the UK, and there's more coming, uh, that basically suggest that having antibodies from natural infection protects you against reinfection. And actually, uh, with a risk reduction that's greater in, in some cases than what we see with vaccines. Uh, this is usually uh, 
protection from any type of reinfection, including asymptomatic reinfection. Uh, so this is very good data. It's of course not absolute. Uh, we know that there are reinfections in some patients, but uh, it's, uh, it's a very good sign and it suggests that antibodies are protective. Now let's switch gears to vaccines. Um, before I go into SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, I, I just wanted to explain explain how this usually works and why it was uh, the development of the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines was so fast this time. Um, so usually when you develop vaccines, um, it starts all in an academic lab, you play around with the design of the vaccine, the immunogen, you vaccinate a lot of mice, you challenge them with the pathogen that you want to develop the vaccine against, uh, then it doesn't work, you try with something else, this can take years. Once you have something that you think works and protects your mice, um, you usually try to find a commercial partner and then you start to get serious to process development to more preclinical studies and so on and so forth. Once you have that data, you submit an IND to the FDA and then you can start a phase one trial, which is usually <clears throat> less than 100 people, it takes one to two years. If the results look good, um, you look for funding and then you might go into a phase two trial which is a little bit larger and usually looks at different dosing regimens um, and if the phase two data looks good um, there's a hard decision to make if you want to go into phase three because phase threes are usually between two and three uh, three hundred million dollars um, and uh, they very often fail right so a lot of vaccines actually make it to phase two and no further uh, if you decide to go to phase two, it takes another two to three years. If the data meet, meet the pre-specified uh, success criteria, uh, you're going to submit a PLA to the FDA. And then uh, they review that, they might come back with more questions and that might take another one to two years. And then you start to produce your vaccine for the market. So this takes about 15 years. Um, for COVID-19, of course, it only took about a year. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. The first one was we skipped this design and exploratory uh, preclinical phase completely. There was enough information from vaccine design with SARS-CoV-1 and with MERS, which are other coronaviruses that, uh, that made trouble in the, in the past. Um, and uh, the process was already developed for many of these candidates, specifically for the RNA vaccines. You can use the same process, you just have to change the sequence. Um, so this moved very quickly and from getting the sequence to the first phase one trial, uh, it basically only took two and a half months. Um, and so uh, then the phase one trials were started, the first one on March 16th, um, and uh, there was an adaptive trial design. So they started with phase one, they did an interim safety analysis, they um, expanded that to a phase two, uh, they did an interim analysis of safety and immunogenicity. And when that uh, data was in and cleared, they started phase three, which you know was already uh, done in, in July. Uh, for some of, or for actually many of these vaccines. And then production at risk started, which is something the companies usually don't do because you have no clue if the vaccine is actually successful, right? And then um, in relatively quickly after the first uh, interim results came in, uh, um, uh, uh, application to the FDA for an emergency use authorization was, uh, was filed. Um, there was uh, the safety data for the vaccines was there, but uh, of course, long-term immunogenicity data was missing. And then the FDA, of course, uh, expedited their review process. And so that was the reason why uh, this could be done in 12, in, in, in 12 months. There was a lot of money uh, to, to fund this, so there were no restrictions on, on resources. We had the technology and we had a lot of knowledge around uh, these viruses already. And there's now many vaccine candidates in development. I'm not going to go through all of them because many of them will never make it to the market, specifically not the US market. Um, but there is uh, four types that you should know about. Um, and I'm showing them here. Uh, one type is inactivated vaccines. Again, those will likely not uh, be used in the US, but they are used right now in Latin America, uh, in China and so on and so forth. Uh, basically, for, for these types of vaccines, it's a very classic method of, of vaccine production. You grow the virus, you inactivate it, you purify it, and that's your vaccine. 
Uh, recombinant protein vaccines are, are more common now. We have one for influenza, and you could also say that the uh, HPV and uh, hepatitis B virus vaccines are recombinant protein vaccines, and one will likely uh, come uh, to the market in the US in the next few months. Um, we have uh, the viral vector vaccines, and uh, J&J just got an emergency use authorization for one of their vaccines. What you do there is you basically have a virus, in this case an adenovirus, um, you uh, take away parts of its genome so it can't replicate itself anymore um, in your cells, but you give it the information for, SAR for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And then when you get vaccinated, your cells make that spike protein and you, uh, your immune system responds to it. And it's similar for the RNA vaccines where you just make messenger RNA carrying the information for the spike protein. This is then packaged into uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles and that's used uh, to, for vaccination and your cells take up this, uh, these particles. Uh, your uh, ribosomes recognize the, uh, the messenger and they then make spike protein and your immune system responds to that. Um, so again, I'm not going to go through all of the data, but all of these vaccine candidates were tested in, in non-human primates, mostly in rhesus macaques. And what we learned there was that all of them are actually protecting against disease. Uh, so if you vaccinate these animals with any of these vaccine candidates, uh, you protect the lung, you don't get any, uh, any disease phenotype. Um, but also what stood out is that in some cases, or actually in almost all cases, you still had um, replication of virus in the upper respiratory tract. So it wasn't sterilizing immunity. And that's something to keep in mind uh, when we talk about uh, vaccinated individuals and, and, uh, and infections. Um, then um, there was a lot of data from phase one and two trials, of course. I'm not going to go through all of that, uh, just to say that the inactivated vaccines gave intermediate neutralizing antibody titers. Uh, for the vectored vaccines, it was mixed. Uh, the consigna vaccine, which is a, a, an AD5 vaccine developed in China, gave very low neutralizing antibody titers. AstraZeneca and also j, &J gave intermediate neutralizing antibody titers. For the RNA vaccines, after the first shot, you make basically very few neutralizing antibodies, but after the second shot, you get very high titers. And for the recombinant protein vaccines, it's basically the same. You need two shots, but then you make a lot of neutralizing antibodies. So just as an overview, what do we have right now? Uh, of course, you have heard about Moderna and Pfizer and their results. Uh, they are highly uh, efficacious and they got emergency use authorization already last year in the US. AstraZeneca has mixed results. Uh, we'll get a little bit into that, but this is now uh, licensed in the European Union. j, &J uh, this is uh, the only one-shot vaccine that is, uh, that is uh, in development, far in development right now. I just got an emergency use authorization um, by the FDA. So this is, we're, we're starting to use this now. And then the Novavax vaccine, uh, which is a recombinant protein vaccine, will likely be the next one that makes it uh, to the market in the US. And then we have other vaccines that uh, are used already and have efficacy data in other parts of the world. Uh, one made by the Gamaleya Institute, that's Sputnik V, um, that's based on two adenovirus vectors. There's a number of uh, inactivated vaccines. As I mentioned, they have different efficacy data depending on the country and the vaccine. And then we have another virus vector for, that is used in China, but there's no efficacy data for that one yet. So um, how do these phase three studies work? Um, it's very straightforward. And as you know, Mount Sinai uh, is, is uh, taking part in, in several of them. Uh, you have a vaccine group. So these people get vaccinated. Uh, you have a placebo control group. Uh, this group usually gets saline solution. Uh, they are usually about the same size. And then these trials are not conducted by the companies that develop the vaccines themselves, but by independent medical centers that are usually geographically distri distributed, often in different countries. You have an independent uh, committee that watches over the data and the safety data, and the analysis time points and success criteria are predefined. That's very important. And so you vaccinate your individuals. They don't know if they got vaccine or, or placebo. Uh, you wait and you count cases basically. And then once you have uh, accumulated enough cases, uh, 
as specified in, in, in the guidelines for the interim interim analysis, you do a first analysis and you calculate your vaccine efficacy. So how does this look? Um, I'm just going to show you the results from Pfizer and then from J and J. Uh, Pfizer had uh, 43,000 individuals in their study. Uh, I was also part of that uh, of that study, um, and they counted 170 COVID-19 cases. They had 162 in the placebo group and eight in the vaccine group. Uh, these groups were roughly the same size, so you can already see here uh, that the vaccine works. They calculated a 95% efficacy against symptomatic disease, meaning one symptom plus PCR-confirmed infection. Um, overall and 94% efficacy in the 65 to 85 year age group. And that's important because of course, we're most concerned about older individuals here. There were no significant safety concerns and this vaccine is now widely used. I'm not going to show you the Moderna data, but it's basically identical. Uh, they had, the, had 30,000 individuals, but data is very similar. The efficacy is very similar and the vaccines are, are basically identical too. Um, and this is how success looks like. This is um, the, the data from the uh, Pfizer vaccine uh, that was submitted to the FDA. Uh, here on the x-axis, we have time after the first dose. And on the y-axis, we basically have uh, cases. And you see these two lines, the red line just keeps going up. And that's the placebo group. There's cases that accumulate. And then you have this blue line that initially trends with the red, uh, red curve. So here we have the first vaccination. And then even before the second vaccination, these lines separate and you get very few cases in the vaccinated group. Uh, so even if this already indicated that even the first shot already gives you uh, pretty good protection. Um, and then because a lot of people are worried about RNA vaccines and uh, that they are first used in humans now at, um, with COVID-19, it's actually not the case. A lot of RNA vaccines have, have been in development um, that started in 2013. There have been a lot of clinical trials. I'm just showing uh, you here a list of uh, trials for infectious diseases, but there's also a lot of uh, trials for cancer vaccines. And actually, um, the CMV vaccine uh, that is developed by Moderna is now in phase two and looks pretty successful. Uh, so there's other RNA vaccines that are moving forward as well. Okay, so Johnson & Johnson, that's uh, much newer data. Um, as I said, uh, they got emergency use authorization uh, very recently, last week. Uh, the nice thing here is one, just one dose is needed. They had a trial with about 43,000 individuals in the US, South Africa, and Latin America, and we'll get back to that. The US efficacy was 72% against moderate to severe COVID-19. Uh, moderate is what other people would call mild. Uh, this just meant two symptoms plus PCR confirmed infection. Uh, they showed 85% efficacy across all studies against severe disease and 100% protection against hospitalization and death. And that's important because uh, part of the study was done in South Africa where basically only the South African variant was circulating. Um, there were no significant uh, safety concerns. Um, and uh, this, is now, this vaccine is now authorized in the US and will likely be uh, licensed also in the EU, European Union in March. Um, again, people are worried about these vectored approaches. They are not new at all. There's an F26-based Ebola vaccine that's used in the European Union, and adenovirus 4 and adenovirus 7 live vaccines have been in use in the U.S. military since 1971 in, in re new recruits. So there is a long uh, safety record for these types of vaccines. Um, still, I want to talk about a little bit about safety, and the first thing I wanted to talk about is reactogenicity. Uh, which is basically uh, a number of, of uh, reactions to the vaccines that people have. Uh, injection site pain, headache, fatigue, elevated temperature, myalgia, uh, mild flu-like symptoms. And those things are usually triggered by an innate immune response to the vaccine. So you make interferon and that's kind of explaining these this, uh, symptoms. Uh, this is unpleasant, but it's not dangerous. Uh, but uh, the RNA vaccines and also some of the vector vaccines have an increased rate for this uh, rate of reactogenicity. And specifically for the RNA vaccines, it's interesting, you get more reactogenicity after the second shot than after the first shot. And this is data from Moderna here. 
Uh, so specifically after the second vaccination, some people feel like they're getting sick. They might even take a sick day. Um, and the good thing is that these uh, symptoms are very transient and usually go away after one or two days. Uh, the other important safety point here is allergic reactions. Um, some people have severe allergic reactions to vaccines. Uh, those people were excluded from the clinical trials. Um, although regular allergic individuals were part of these trials, and when the vaccine was rolled out, there were a few uh, severe reactions to the vaccine. Um, and uh, now we have numbers about that. The CDC uh, estimates that you have about 11 uh, severe allergic reactions per 1 million vaccinated individuals for Pfizer and about 2.5 per 1 million for Moderna. Uh, that's not, uh, you know, it's not great, but it's it's also not really concerning for the individual. And specifically, if somebody knows that uh, that he or she has reactions, bad reactions to vaccines, uh, that can be shared with uh, with uh, whoever vaccinates you, and uh, there can be uh, precautions taken. Uh, another thing, and that just came out yesterday in New England Journal of Medicine, is uh, delayed large local reactions. Uh, this is mostly seen with the Moderna vaccine. And there were case reports, um, as I said yesterday, uh, during the clinical trials, um, Moderna saw erythema in duration and tenderness for about 0.8% uh, of individuals after the first vaccination, 0.2% after the second vaccination, but relatively quickly after vaccination. And there are now case reports um, where people have uh, these reactions uh, about a week after they got vaccinated. Um, this resolves then relatively quickly and there's actually no complications, but of course it drew attention because as you can see, uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't look great and people are, are scared when they see that. And it seems to be a T-cell hypersensitivity seen mostly in female patients. And it's not a contraindication for a second shot. Actually, um, a lot of people don't get it when they then have the second shot. They only have it after the first shot. And it also resolves faster. But I wanted to mention it because that came out yesterday. Um, then the next question is, does the vaccine protect from asymptomatic infection? And we already um, touched upon that when we talked about the non-human primates. Now, um, asymptomatic infections are possible if, you're, if, you, if you have been vaccinated, um, especially after the first vaccination, that might still happen. Uh, the Moderna trial saw a 60% reduction in asymptomatic uh, infections after the first shot, but we don't really have good data on that. What we know from the non-human primate data and some data from Israel is that uh, like, uh, if a vaccinated person gets infected, uh, the person is likely less infectious and for a shorter period of time. So the chance that the virus is passed on to somebody else is lower than with somebody who is not vaccinated. And this is similar to other vaccines like influenza and pertussis. This is nothing special about the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Uh, how long does protection last? Honest answer, we don't know yet, but based on what we know from other vaccines, um, and from natural infection, it's likely that uh, the, uh, the protection lasts uh, at least uh, a few years. Uh, might be that a booster dose is needed at some point. Uh, the important point here is if, if one of the variants uh, requires an update of the vaccine, of course, that would have to be given earlier. Um, another question, I'm actively working on that together with my colleague Viviana Simon. Uh, should individuals who already had a SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection get vaccinated? And if yes, how often? So the current guideline is uh, that people independently of an infection history with SARS-CoV-2 should get both shots. And so we started to look into that uh, with one of our longitudinal studies. And what we found is that uh, if people already had a SARS-CoV-2 infection, and then get their first shot, they react very, very strongly, and they actually make an antibody response that's superior uh, than the antibody response that the naive individual makes after the second shot. And this is basically shown here on the left side. Uh, so we have in blue, naive individuals, in orange, individuals who had SARS-CoV-2 infections. And when they get their first shot, the, uh, the positive ones shoot up very quickly and then have a very high titer. Actually, the second shot doesn't do much anymore. While if you are naive, uh, you have delayed kinetics and then uh, there is an increase from the, uh, from the uh, first to the second shot. Uh, it is also important to note that uh, people who have 
who had SARS-CoV-2 and then get their first shot have uh, more reactogenicity, specifically systemic reactogenicity after their, uh, their first shot. Um, and another topic that I want to discuss uh, is variants of concern. Um, and you have to be careful about the nomenclature here, and I'm, I'm going to explain this. Uh, these three variants that I'm listing here are variants of concern. You hear about other variants, and I will talk a little bit about that. Uh, they are variants of interest. We are not concerned about them yet, uh, even if the New York Times says uh, it, we should be concerned about them. So the variants of concern right now include uh, B117, which is uh, the British uh, variant, B1351, which is the South African variant, and P1, which is the Brazilian variant. And what we know about these viruses is that they seem to be more infectious, and that's how they were detected, because they expanded and took over infections in, in their respective countries. There's right now no strong uh, indication that, or no strong evidence that they cause more severe disease, but they're a little bit more infectious. And for the British variant, we know that's about 35% more. The reason for that is likely that um, they interact uh, easier with our receptor. So uh, I'm showing you here again a model or a, a structure of the spike protein. Here's again our receptor binding domain, and here's the receptor ACE2. And specifically, this mutation at position 501, which is present in all of these variants of concern, uh, might actually increase the affinity to the receptor, and that might explain why, why they are more infectious. Um, there is uh, a set of, as I just said, a set of mutations uh, in these variants. The N501Y is common among all of them. And then uh, the uh, South African and the, uh, the Brazilian one have another set of mutations in the receptor binding domain, which might actually impact on antibody binding. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, how do these uh, variants um, uh, emerge. Uh, typically, uh, SARS coronavir SARS, uh, coronaviruses are an exception for, for uh, RNA viruses because they have proofreading activity and they mutate much slower than, for example, influenza. Uh, however, if there is explosive spread, if there's a lot of infections, um, the virus goes through many replication cycles, and then you have, of course, more mutations. Uh, but what has been seen is that uh, these variants mostly emerge in immunocompromised patients who are infected over a long period of time. Uh, here's just one example from a New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, where somebody was infected over many, many days and uh, was sick. the virus was sequenced uh, several times over time. And you actually see exactly those mutations pop up that we see in the variants, E484K, uh, uh, N501Y, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that these variants actually come from immunocompromised patients. And this is how one of them was detected. This is data from South Africa. Uh, you see here in October, they start to see this, uh, this variant in, 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 ye uh, in yellow. This is P1351. And then within a few weeks, it actually takes over all the infections in South Africa. And that's how we call these variants. That's how we uh, determine that they are more infectious. Now, what does this all mean? Um, we have here our, our three variants on the left. Uh, we know that uh, B117, the British variant, has minor impact on monoclonal antibody therapeutics, uh, but uh, B1351 and P P1 are a problem for Eli Lilly's uh, therapeutic antibody, although the Regeneron antibody, because it's a cocktail, might still work. There's, of course, a lot of new monoclonals in development, in clinical development, uh, that don't have that problem and still deal well with the variants. In terms of the neutral, neutralization activity of convalescent and vaccine serum, we know that there's little impact with the British variant. Uh, there's a relatively strong induction, uh, uh, reduction in neutralizing activity against the South African variant. Um, in many individuals, there's even a loss of neutralizing activity, and there's a moderate impact on neutralizing activity post-vaccination. And for P1, uh, the Brazilian variant, there's little data, but it looks like similar to the South African variant, uh, might be, the situation might be a little bit better though. What do we know about imp impact on vaccine uh, efficacy? 
Um, so I'm listing here uh, five vaccines that are used or that are in late phase uh, three clinical trials. The ones with the red arrows are the one that, ones that are used in the US right now. Uh, for j, &J we know it's 72% uh, efficacious. Um, there is no data on B117, but there's probably no impact. And there is data because they did a clinical trial in South Africa with that variant. There's a reduction to 57% effic efficacy. This is actually not a big reduction. and This still looks pretty good. Similar data for Novavax. Uh, the issue here is AstraZeneca because uh, they showed in South Africa against this variant that they basically lost ef efficacy. For Pfizer uh, and Moderna, there's really no efficacy data because these trials were done before the variants emerged. Um, but the in vitro data looks pretty good and we are probably um, in a ballpark of j and uh, meaning that there might be some reduction in efficacy, uh, but not really drastic reduction. When I talk about reduction in efficacy here, I really mean against symptomatic disease. Even the j and vaccine had 100% efficacy against hospitalization uh, in and in, in death in in, uh, in South Africa. So uh, the, they, they, these vaccines probably work very well against severe disease induced by the variants. Uh, this is just to give you an idea about where we are with these variants. Um, they are not very common in the US. The most common is P117, which as I said, is not a big problem for vaccines. Uh, P1 and P1351 are very, very rare. There's just a handful of cases. And this here is the situation in New York where we see P117, the British variant, come up, uh, but we basically don't see the other two variants. And then you probably have heard about uh, the New York variant, P1526, uh, and that's a variant of interest. It's not a variant of concern, uh, but we see that, and this is from uh, pathogen surveillance at Mount Sinai, uh, we see that coming up. Uh, it's actually three different variants that are lumped together, uh, but there seems to be an increase, and we're, we're monitoring and also characterizing these viruses over time. And so how how many people have been vaccinated so far? Uh, just to, to wrap up here, approximately 271 million doses have been used. Most of them RNA vaccines. Israel is really the, the leader with vaccination. Uh, they have uh, vaccinated 53% of their population once, 39% uh, twice. But the US is doing pretty well as well. Uh, we have vaccinated about 16% uh, of the population once and 8% twice. And I think that's pretty good. Uh, especially, especially when you compare it with other countries. And then uh, this is actually my last data slide. Um, we know that these vaccines work well in phase three clinical trials, but now there's more and more data. And these three papers came out in the last two weeks uh, showing that the effectiveness in the population is actually also very high. Uh, so remember the efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine against symptomatic uh, illness in phase three trials was 95%. In Israel, they found that the effectiveness, so now how well it works in the population, is 94%. And this is outstanding. And I think this is really a very good sign that uh, will bring this, uh, this pandemic under control with vaccines. So just to conclude, efficacy of many vaccines and vaccine candidates against symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, in, in, in humans and infection of the lung in non-human primates is just outstanding. These vaccines are great. Uh, the protection uh, from upper respiratory tract infection is often only partial, but we think that there is going to be a significant impact on, on inhibiting transmission as well. Several vaccines are authorized in the US already, more vaccines are coming, and uh, some of the variants may reduce vaccine efficacy to some degree, uh, but A, they are not very common in the US, and B, uh, the reduction is probably going to be minor to moderate, so I, I wouldn't be too worried about that. And with that, um, I just wanted to thank uh, a lot of people at Mount Sinai and at, uh, at collaborating universities. Uh, we did. Uh, we had a lot of collaborations here. We had uh, a lot of work that was done over the last 14 months. And so I want to thank everybody who contributed. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Dr. Kramer. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. Uh, we already have a lot of questions in the chat, but people are free to mute themselves and uh, post their questions in person. However, we'll go with the chat first because they just been, you know, throwing questions at you uh, for the past 10 minutes. 
Um, so um, Dr. Stavropoulos, one of our ID physicians, is asking if the efficacy of the mRNA vaccine will be higher than an actual infection against, you know, the variants, for instance, South African variant. Uh, that's not clear. Uh, there is a lot of arguments right now about reinfections with these variants. Uh, there is some data that suggests that there is widespread reinfection, uh, but there's no hard data. This is mostly based on modeling. Um, there's some data from the Novavax trial where they saw reinfection uh, and no effect of, of pre-existing immunity, but there are question marks about how they assessed uh, zero positivity. Uh, in, in that trial. Um, and there is other reports that actually show that reinfection, even with the variants, is rare. Um, so, you know, I think if you haven't been infected yet, you should get vaccinated. You shouldn't get infected to protect yourself. Um, but uh, I, I think it's going to be comparable, honestly. Um, what we do see is that people who had an infection and then get a, vac a vaccination mount very high titers against the variants as well. So they are probably the, the best protected uh, population. But again, uh, I wouldn't recommend to get uh, voluntarily infected and then get, I mean, that, you know, yeah. people should, should get vaccinated. That's going to protect them. Um, we have another question from uh, Dr. John Stover, one of our uh, POM uh, fellows. He's a senior fellow. He's asking, should we be concerned about resurgence of the infection in Manaus, Brazil, where they thought to have herd immunity, or do you think herd immunity from the vaccine might protect us from resurgence? Um, two things. I'm not too concerned about, about the situation in Brazil. Uh, there was, a, I think, a New York Times article this week uh, about reinfections and that they uh, see many reinfections. They didn't see that. They modeled that. Um, there's no hard proof uh, that they actually occur at a, a high rate. That's important to keep in mind and that modeling is based on data that might not be that great. So I, I would not worry about that too much. Uh, the herd immunity is a different story. I think using this term doesn't really help us. It, it's complicated. And actually the term was not used or kind of uh, replaced by the term community immunity, um, but um, because that actually expresses better what's going on, right? You might have parts of, of New York, for example, uh, where there's very little circulation of the virus anymore and a lot of people are immune. And there might be other parts of New York or even a neighborhood in the same borough that doesn't have that and there is a lot of virus circulation, right? So talking about herd immunity in general if, is, is not very helpful. Uh, I think what we should try to achieve is uh, immunization rates that uh, that make the, the virus manageable, right? There's very little circulation of virus. The risk for everybody is low. Um, and if people are vaccinated, um, they don't get sick, right? So we need to get to a level where uh, a few cases of SARS-CoV-2 occur, but we can manage them. And I mean, that's the case with many of many other virus infections as well. Um, but I think they to, to believe that we can get to herd immunity and then the virus will just disappear is an illusion. I don't think that this virus will ever go away anymore. It will most likely become human coronavirus 5. We already have four of them that uh, cause common colds. Great. Thank you very much. We keep getting more questions. I have a question for uh, Melissa Wiener. She's asking, I believe you mentioned that patients who had natural infection do not generally get asymptomatic reinfection, but that people who were vaccinated can get asymptomatic disease if exposed with possible shedding. Can you comment on this further and the mechanism behind it? Yeah, sure. The, the difference is that when you get infected, you mount a mucosal immune response, uh, you mount a systemic immune response, you get the T cell response against many different proteins. When you get vaccinated, you make an immune response against the spike protein, right? Um, and you make a systemic immune response, but you have very little mucosal immune response. And the mucosal immune response is actually what protects your upper respiratory tract, right? And so that's the, the component that's missing there. And that's probably why natural infection is a little bit better against, uh, against asymptomatic infection than, than vaccination is. Great, thank you very much. That's a great answer. Um, then Richard Jones, one of our residents is asking, can you explain the rationale for a second dose in seropositive patients? It looks like per your data, 
the seropositive patients reach target titers after just one dose? Yeah, there's no rationale. Uh, there is now, I think, uh, 11 papers that all show the same. Uh, and uh, there are actually efforts to, to discuss with the CDC uh, if the recommendation should be changed. Uh, we haven't succeeded yet, uh, but uh, countries in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, including France and Italy, actually changed their recommendations partially based on our data. So I don't see any sense in it. Right now it's policy and it should be done. Uh, I cannot recommend uh, only giving one shot. Uh, because that's not policy right now, but I think it would make sense to change the policy. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Martin Maskin. Um, he says, does the emergence of variants now justify the need for a second dose? I'm not sure what he means by second. Maybe he means a second vaccine. Like that mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good yes. question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Kramer. Uh, it's a good question. If, if I guess uh, the, the question is, um, do we need another vaccine that now covers the variants, right? And I think that's something that is discussed right now, um, but the bar for that is really high. If you look at the J&J data, if you go from 72 to 57, yeah, that's a drop. But how much of a drop is it really? Does it justify that we have to revaccinate everybody? Does it ju justify that we now need to make a new vaccine that needs to go through clinical testing? Um, and so it, it hasn't been really uh, officially established what would be needed uh, to trigger a strain change or a change of the vaccine, right? Of course, all the vaccine producers are preparing this. They are starting clinical trials just to look at bivalent vaccines, just to look at prime boost regimens where you give the old version first and then followed by the new version. Uh, this is all getting tested in order to be ready if it's becoming necessary. But right now, uh, it, it doesn't look like this is going to be necessary, specifically not in the US. I think South Africa and Brazil are a different story because um, if you look at South Africa, they only have the variant circulating, nothing else. While in the US, uh, it's, it's basically uh, almost all garden variety SARS-CoV-2. Great, thank you, Dr. Cameron. We have more questions. I think this is a record of a number of questions. Um, also, soon, uh, Tess Jacobs is asking, should pregnant women receive the vaccine? And at what point in time? Good question. I don't have an answer. Um, so the recommendation is that uh, if, if people, specifically healthcare workers, are at risk uh, contracting the virus, they're pregnant, they should think about getting vaccinated, they should discuss it with their physician, and they should make an uh, informed decision about that. There's no indication right now that there would be any issue with vaccinating during pregnancy. I can't tell you what the right time point is, but of course, uh, there is not enough data to exclude that there is some risk, right? Uh, so there's not no good guidance. Uh, the the uh, FDA basically told us that it's personal responsibility and it's our decision. Um, so there's no good uh, good response to that. Great. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Reef Pastor, one of our hospitalists at Morningside. She's asking, to what extent do you think the vaccine will prevent the so-called long COVID syndrome, given that it can develop in patients who have mild disease? Uh, what do you think of people with long COVID reporting improvement in symptoms after being vaccinated? Um, yeah, so this is uh, very interesting. I have heard about these reports too, um, and it could be that there is residual antigen or virus somewhere uh, that contributes to long COVID and then you enhance your immune response and that, uh, that reservoir gets cleared and that could be the mechanism behind that. But I honestly don't think we have enough data to, uh, to, to draw conclusions there. In terms of uh, developing long COVID, I think the vaccines are very efficacious in, in preventing disease in general. And I think if you prevent disease, you're also preventing long COVID. Um, of course, that also needs to be studied and we don't have firm data on that, but uh, I can't imagine that uh, a short asymptomatic infection would contribute a lot to long COVID. Although I know that mild, uh, there's a lot of, of people who had mild cases and then developed it, but there's more data needed. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Um, David Campbell. He says that I had a patient develop Bell's palsy from the Pfizer vaccine. 
which was mild lasting 72 hours after the first dose and recurred more severe after the booster. How to manage these patients? So I'm a scientist, I'm not an MD, right? So it's hard for me to answer how to manage the patient. I can just tell you that this was seen in the clinical trial. That was one of the things that were discussed with the FDA. They were not very concerned about it because the rate was very low, but it can occur uh, as a side effect with, with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, we have another question from Dr. Braun. She's one of our pulmonologists. She's asking, does the reaction to the vaccination correlate with host responsiveness and antibody titer, meaning no reaction for protection? No. Um, I can tell you from, from personal experience, uh, the only thing I had uh, after the first shot was a sore arm. After the second shot was a sore arm, no systemic response, and my antibody titers are sky high. And I know that the same is true for two of my colleagues. So there's, there's really no uh, correlation necessarily between how bad your your uh, your uh, rectogenicity is and how high your antibody titers are going to be. Um, we have one more question from Mark Gorney. He's asking, uh, flu vaccines include different strains of the virus. Could the current COVID vaccines be manufactured to vaccinate against more than one strain or is the technology limited to one strain at a time? And this is yeah, no, this is a very good question, um, and they can. Uh, I think there is no reason why that, that wouldn't be a possibility. Um, but there is no data emerging from South Africa uh, that shows that if you take zero from people who had uh, an infection with the B1351, the South African variant, they actually neutralized the other variants or the other viruses pretty well. So uh, the relationship, the antigenic relationship doesn't seem to be um, symmetric, meaning that if you have regular SARS-CoV-2 and you make antibodies, they don't neutralize the, the South African variant well, but it's, it's not true the other way around. Um, and we see convergent evolution, right? So uh, for the Brazilian variant, the P1 variant, um, two of the three key mutations are the same uh, between Bra the Brazilian variant and the South African variant. Uh, another one is different, but it's the same position. And the likelihood is extremely high, although there is no data yet, that uh, a vaccine that has the South African variant would work very well against uh, uh, the Brazilian variant. So it's likely that we won't need a multivalent vaccine. It's likely that it just needs an update at some point um, if we decide that it's worth updating. it. And again, this is not clear yet. I do have a question. <clears throat> I have to ask you as a, as a conclusion about your million dollar question, which you have previously noted to be so. We now know that the neutralizing activity of the antibodies, they, it correlates nicely with the rising titer. But do you have an answer to the million dollar question? What is the titer that prevents A, infection and B, clinical uh, disease? Yeah, so- uh, I had to. I, I, no, no, it's a very good question. Uh, for for uh, rhesus macaques, I can tell you it's one to 100. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't know for humans yet. Um, there is a, a lot of effort going into looking into that um, from, from the side of the vaccine manufacturers, but also from, from uh, other studies like our Berry study, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's really an important question, um, not just because we want to you know, know when we have to revaccinate a patient or uh, if we have to vaccinate a patient at all. It's also question for global vaccine development. What we see right now is that, yes, the US and Israel and Europe, we're getting a lot of vaccine, right? Um, but the rest of the world has not yeah, much Africa effort. in particular. And there's a lot of other vaccine companies uh, that are developing vaccines that are now in phase two, phase one, phase two. And uh, it would be hard for them, for many of them, and very expensive to go through phase three, large phase three trials, like Pfizer has done it or Moderna, where you really look at how many people get sick, right? So if you would have an, a neutralizing data that correlates with protection, you could license vaccines just based on that uh, yes. correlate of protection. And so I think there is a huge effort to, to get this done. And we were thinking we would have it in fall, but uh, it wasn't the case yet. Um, but since then, we had a lot of infections in these natural history cohorts. Um, and of course, there's more and more vaccine data and breakthrough data. So I'm still 
confident that we'll have a titer uh, relatively soon, but uh, I can't answer that uh, yet for you. Not here. yet. So there's still a lot that we don't know. Unfortunately. Dr. Kramer, I have a quick question. So um, I'm a Dr. Oso here over ID, Gina. Uh, for the Paris study, I saw the data earlier um, and you presented it again today, but what is there any difference between age group and the titers that we're seeing? Both with and with people who had COVID or not. So we didn't do a. We are analyzing the data right now. So um, because we actually had a, a number of infections in the in the Barry study, right? Not reinfections, infections. So we can actually also calculate the risk ratio there. Um, but uh, we didn't do an age specific analysis yet. What we do know. Um, is that for the vaccines, uh, older people mount lower antibody titers. Uh, this is not surprising at all. This is what we see with many vaccines. And for COVID vaccines, this has been seen by Pfizer. It has been seen by uh, AstraZeneca. It has been seen uh, by some of the Chinese companies that did that analysis. Uh, that's normal. Um, right now, it looks like even old people, even if they have lower titers, they're above what's needed to be protected. Um, but we don't know how this develops over time. But uh, yeah, good point. We'll, we'll have to check for the Berry study. Uh, we, we didn't do that analysis yet. Dr. Kramer, I want to really thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, you know, I, it won't surprise you to know everyone in the audience has been uh, working valiantly taking care of these patients who are hospitalized and also really doing tremendous work in the outpatient setting. And it's heartwarming for all of us to know that we have such, such excellence in our scientific community here at Mount Sinai in support of the next important chapters in this work. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And, and we're really very grateful. Thanks for the invitation to, to give a talk. And what I wanted to say is, um, you know, scientists are usually working in their labs and the clinicians are working uh, with patients. And I think what we have seen during this pandemic, specifically at Sinai, all of a sudden we're working together and I really enjoy that. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very nice to see that. And uh, there are benefits that are going in both directions. So that's very nice to see. <laughs>